One thing I always ask my Learning Hack guests is where they find their learning inspiration. The Learning Technologies Exhibition and Conference in London is a frequent answer. Celebrating its 25th year, it's been a key source of knowledge for me personally, bringing together the best in global learning. With some 10,000 attendees expected and more than 200 free floor seminars, it's a must-go-to show. Join us in London on April the 17th and 18th. Register now at learningtechnologies.co.uk. learningtechnologies.co.uk. After spending World Learning Content Cleanup Day cleaning up your content libraries, you've got all your ducks in a row, right? To really get a grip on our content, we need a good content strategy. That's why we've teamed up with learning experts Mike Taylor and Bianca Baumann for a webinar about all things content strategy. We'll discuss smart tactics like content audits, content repurposing, and retiring content. Check out anewspring.com or the link in the show notes to join us on April 9th. Everybody is talking about AI all the time. And according to Don Taylor's influential GSS survey, everybody in learning is talking about AI all the time too. But why is it so big in learning? And what are we really talking about when we talk about AI? Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helm. Now, guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is fun. Knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Learning. Don Taylor's L&D Global Sentiment Survey asks the question every year, what's going to be hot in L&D? No surprise, really, that the answer that came back this year was, duh, AI. But the scale of the vote for AI was unprecedented. So we wanted to dig into that a bit with Don. Kate Fitzgerald, head of fact. OK, everybody knows who Don Taylor is, but for those at the back of the class who haven't been paying attention, fill us in, please. Hack facts. Don Taylor is a well-recognised commentator and thinker in the fields of workplace learning and supporting technologies. He speaks worldwide and has chaired the Learning Technologies Conference in London since 2000. His annual L&D Global Sentiment Survey, started in 2014, provides a unique perspective on L&D trends from over 100 countries. He is the author of Learning Technologies in the Workplace, a graduate of Oxford University and in 2016 was awarded an honorary doctorate by Middlesex University in recognition of his work developing the L&D profession. Don has been doing the rounds of other people's podcasts with the latest survey, but you know we will always ask different questions at The Learning Hack. This was a really interesting discussion at a time when the L&D community, something Don has been at the centre of for almost a quarter of a century, seems to see itself at a turning point. Is AI going to be the catalyst for workplace learning to surge forward bravely and finally come into its own? Or is it sounding its death knell? So, Donald, great to have you back on the podcast again. Always a pleasure to be here, John. Welcome back to The Learning Hack. I'm going to say something which might disturb some of our listeners now, but there are actually <laughs> other podcasts about learning. Um, what? I know, it's terrible, isn't it? You know, you thought people had better things to do with their time. But, um, <laughs> and, and you've been on most of them recently, um, talking about the uh, latest issue of your excellent annual sentiment survey, GSS, of people's Thank expectations you. for the coming year. And it's all over LinkedIn um, and Twitter and so on. Uh, so I have to assume that some of the audience, at least, will have heard something about it already. In particular, I can hardly recommend a fairly in-depth look at it on the Mind Tools L&D podcast. I can't believe I'm plugging the opposition here. What's, it's, what's it's going not on? The opposition. <laughs> We're all a community, yes. <laughs> Um, but we have different questions on this podcast. We do try to. But the headline, headline result um, is probably pretty well known by now. This year was almost a complete AI shutout. Uh, what's going to be hot in 2024 in learning, you asked? AI, and by quite a unique margin. So how did you feel when you looked at the data and realised what an extraordinary year this was for the survey? And I look at the data coming in every day on the survey, and... <laughs> 
it makes me sound so sad, but I do. I pour over my laptop and I look at the data and I was initially excited and then woe be gone because I thought, how on earth am I going to make a story out of this? Everyone knows AI is going to be number one. Um, what on earth is there to say about? And there are a number of things to say about it, fortunately. But I was also very well aware that although I've always led with that question, it's the one question we've had for the past 11 years on the survey, the one obligatory question, what will be hot next year? There's also a question which I've asked for this year and the previous two years, which is what's your greatest challenge for the coming year? And the answer to that was very enlightening this year. So there is more to the survey than just, oh, people like AI. We can look at how important AI is. We can look at what it tells us about the L&D profession. We can look at how other votes have suffered as a result of AI being so popular. And we can also look at the challenges people are suffering. I want to come to the challenges in a minute, but um, for now, I'd I just wonder, has there ever been a year when a particular technology dominated like this? And if not, why do you think it's happening with AI rather than any other? I mean, that might seem rather an obvious answer, but there have been big kind of step changes in technology for, like when smartphones came in, for instance, and um, uh, every, everybody had to move to that. But they haven't necessarily had such a kind of big result as this. The smartphone technology, for example, was super popular right at the beginning of the millennium. So 2007 at Learning Technologies, I was desperately looking for a, a mobile learning case study to put on the agenda. And I eventually found one at the end, which involved people using text. And everyone was desperately unimpressed by it because they wanted something that used smartphone capability. In 2014, on the first survey, mobile delivery came top of the list. But it was it got something like, I don't know, I can't remember, 13% of the vote or, or more because it was a very small sample. But it was nowhere near the 21.5% that AI got this year. Um, so why has AI dominated so much? It is because we've had this constant stream of news, information, and opinion literally every day, and very often new real functionality being announced every week over the course of 2023. That's what's different this year. There has never been, I say this year, in this year, the 2024 survey, what's different is that in 2023, there was a constant, unending deluge of information, opinion, and news about what was happening. And, I mean, I, the, the Daily Star, which is a uh, tabloid red-top newspaper in the UK, which had at least 10 stories on the front page about AI, where normally that would be reserved for politics, for, not for politicians, for celebrities and footballers. Um, and I think the most recent one was something about sausage rolls that I saw on the Daily Star and the news agents. And uh, and yet they had AI. Now, that, that would never happen. If it gets as far as the Daily Star, you could be absolutely sure that every outlet that we are exposed to is talking about AI. And when that happens... We know that it's in people's minds. It's what I call the wordscape, John. It's the, the words that surround us, like the landscape we're in. It affects us, even unconsciously. And because of that, when you ask people what's hot, they're going to respond with AI. Certainly. I mean, the deluge is the right word for it. It's, um, it, it's kind of everywhere you look. Um, uh, talking of about this in relation to past years. Uh, the survey's been running since 2013. Uh, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. It's now becoming a longitudinal study, longitudinal study, so to speak. It's going to be the posh name. I don't know if you, you're, you kind of want to back off that. You're quite modest about this survey, although um, people do tend to say it's very important. Um, Mind tools helpfully charted how the various trends have come and gone, you know, a load of um, different colored lines on the graph. Very, Really, really good to have a look at. If, if um, we'll put a link to that in show notes, perhaps. Um, and it looks to be like AI has a different shape to all the others. In other words, you know, there's a kind of characteristic uh, shape to the curve. Um, something might might linger around for a bit, then leap up, and then gradually uh, kind of diminish in importance um, year on year as people just kind of get used to it, and then something else comes up. A, the the AI curve is completely different. Um, could you relate that to the Gartner height curve, maybe, or what does their visualization over time say to you? I mean, you must do your own 
kind of charting of all this as well. Yeah. And what goes into the eventual report is <laughs> is what's left after I've gone through a whole bunch of looking at different hypotheses and what about this? What about that? Did these people who voted for that also vote for this? How does it vary? For example, John, I, exp- I explore how does the native language of the person affect their voting? I haven't published anything about that yet. Turns out to be yeah. super interesting. One of the things I do is exactly the chart that uh, Ghent, I think it's Ahmed Hajj at uh, Mind Tools produce, yeah. which is what's the position for these, for all the options. And I, I don't publish it because it's it's a huge lot of lines and it's very confusing, unless you know what you're talking about. But actually, it was a great, he did a great job. Um, how does it relate to the Gartner hype cycle? I have actually plotted the not the chronological number of years, but the number of years since something was put onto the survey, onto the x-axis. So the first year, second year, third year, and so on. And there is absolutely a fairly normal pattern of, as you say, starts off at one place, goes up typically, and then comes down because we start getting used to it. And then very often, actually, it picks up at the bottom uh, as it starts moving into, it has a sort of second phase after about five years. So there, there is a curve there. Um, which perhaps at some point in the future, when I have enough data to be confident of putting it forward, I'll call the Taylor curve. <laughs> and it shows the, it does show that the Gartner hype cycle has some form of uh, validity that can be supported with data. But what's so extraordinary about the AI curve, the, 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 well, the curve for AI follows this pattern, but the picking up bit after the five years is absolutely extraordinarily large. And it just, mm. it would, if I include that in the averages, well, it's, it would skew all the other data. But so it's the, it's the same pattern. It goes up, it comes down, it picks up a bit, but it doesn't pick up a bit, it picks up extraordinarily. I think, John, the reason for AI's dominance is not just the deluge. And after all, Ethan Mollick, the uh, professor at Stanford, said back in October, and it's his job, his job to follow this stuff. He said, I follow this stuff and I can't keep up, right? He, he was saying he couldn't keep up in October. It made me feel a bit better. We couldn't keep up with all this new stuff being released, but it wasn't. And this is the difference between now and the introduction of smartphone. The difference was, firstly, it was all pervading. So smartphones were exciting, but they were one part of life. AI has been dominating a variety of discussions around life, from how you do your shopping to do we trust the photographs we see to a whole bunch of other things. So it's been all pervasive in a way that mobile phones work. But the other thing, and I think this is crucial to it latching on to an emotional response in people, is that the news has not been entirely positive. In fact, it's been a real scare story as well as an exciting story. And so you have these, the regular portrayals of AI as being something like the Terminator from the movies. Mm. Um, That's usually how it's portrayed, or it's a robot or something. And there are a number of scare stories and a number of, unfortunately, valid scare stories about the use of AI, Canada Air's use of chatbot for its customer support, Um, a Texas car showroom for its customer support, both creating real problems for the owners of those companies. Um, People who've put companies' data, and there's a number of companies who've done this at the beginning of um, the process of ChatGPT coming out, putting company data online, discovering they've given up the crown jewels of their intellectual property. Um, So there's a a bunch of scare stories around it, which has accentuated in people's minds how important AI is. So I think that's one reason behind that extraordinary curve. And I've never seen anything like that number, and I've never seen anything like the constant, constant, I'll use the word again, deluge of news. I don't see that happening again in 2024. It's already started calming down. And I think I'm very much looking forward to the results of the survey uh, when we run it again in November, December, to see how much have has the excitement and panic receded. We have to wait. But you'll invite me back uh, to discuss it again, John, because it's going to be the big story next year. Uh, are yeah. we still enthralled to AI? Well, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> of course, of course, you have an open invitation <laughs> to go on every year until um, we fall off the perch. Um, yeah, I, I wonder, coming back on that, <laughs> what, what we're really talking about in this kind of, the, the way the curve dramatically leaps up is not necessarily the whole of AI, because AI has been rumbling along the background and other types of AI rumble along in the background yeah, still. Yeah. 
you know, and adaptive yeah. learning. And we, we all know those companies who, who've been working on that for a, for a good yeah. long while. It's generative AI uh, we are talking about. Uh, my personal view on that is that it's suddenly moved from being a thing in maths to an event in language. And that makes so much difference because far more people use language than know how to use maths. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's kind of all over the tabloids is because suddenly this this is like a, a machine talking back to you and um, passing the Turing test, making us realize the Turing test is actually a kind of, you know, nice little game, but it, it's really quite ir irrelevant in a sense because this thing do doesn't have personality, emotions or intentionality, but it looks as if it has to the extent that it can fool us. And yes. this has made everybody focus very much on AGI. Have we already reached AGI uh, and and raised all those fears again? But I, I, I know it'd be impossible to do this, but it, it might be quite interesting if you actually took out Gen AI as a trend and separated that from general AI, <laughs> because I'm sure the general AI thing would then have more of a kind of typical um, crawling up the slope of the, the gradual slope of enlightenment, is it called, in the Gartner model rather than this kind of sudden jerk upwards into up to, up to the peak of expectations and then yeah. tumbling into the um the it trough of disillusionment the, the trough of disillusionment and then crawls slowly up the slope of usefulness the to the plateau is. of productivity yes Pla plateau um, productivity. i think that the um let's go back to this question of should i should i have differentiated possibly uh and in fact uh mark zao sanders of um filtered said don't you've got a you got to differentiate between AI and generative AI in the survey, surely. And there are two answers to this, two reasons why I said no. One is um, no, because I had artificial intelligence on the survey in 2017, and suddenly I'm making things more complicated. And I'm very keen on having a good longitudinal data set where I can compare apples with apples. And there are enough difficulties already with the data set that I don't want to introduce another one. So I'm going to keep it just being AI. But the other thing is, I think if you start introducing a differentiator, people will start saying, well, I'm not quite sure which one you're referring to. I'll just tick both. Um, and I don't know that would happen, but I, I am afraid I do not have sufficient confidence in that the respondents of the survey have the sophisticated understanding of the difference between AI and generative AI to be able to make that differentiation. Now, we don't define the terms anywhere. We don't tell people. When we say hot, we mean this. We don't say what mobile delivery means or personalization means. And in fact, that's a very good example because personalization slash adaptive delivery has been on since at least 2016. And I would argue that in people's minds, that the meaning of that term has changed over those years. So there are already difficulties with it. Anyway, so we don't define the terms. And I think it would just be, I'd be on a hiding to nothing trying to differentiate it. But I share your view, John. I would love to see <laughs> what the data looks like. I just don't think I can do it and maintain the integrity of the survey. Um, I do think in terms of your language point, it's a really good one. AI has moved from being something that's to do with shuffling data around in the background to something that appears sentient. I would say very strongly it's not, um, but that's that's a whole other separate conversation. Here's the thing. We confuse, as human beings, verbal fluency with intelligence. And we know this because there are lots of politicians who aren't very intelligent, but are very verbally fluent who persuade us that they know what they're talking about when they don't. And it's not just politicians. Well, lots of people who can string words together, don't use filler words, and can come up with a coherent argument based on knowledge. You think, well, they sound like they know what they're talking about. That's how we judge people. And suddenly, AI can do this, or generative AI can do this, and it's scary. And I think that is one reason why it is it leapt into people's imaginations, as you say, because it seemed to be so completely fluently able by the traditional proxy standard that we have for intelligence, which is how verbally fluent are people. I would argue that one knock-on effect of this is going to be that people will start being more discerning about how we judge people's intelligence as well as how we judge machines' intelligence. And I think that's probably got to be a good thing. I think it's a good answer. And I, I, I think you're right. It, it would be difficult to disentangle uh, generative AI from other types of AI largely because people wouldn't understand what you're talking about. And then there may be other, you know, 
items in the typology of AI that you'd have to include, and it all get a bit something only for wonks. <laughs> <laughs> Much as we both enjoy being wonks. <clears throat> Now I do um, love. I have to confess, I do love. I do love sitting in front of the data, just asking questions, getting the answers back, and wondering what it means, and going back and asking it again, and then trying to figure out: can can I defend this? Can I can this argument? What about this? What about that? And mm. so, yeah, I, I'm. I guess I qualify as a wonk from that point of view. Um, but I could. I can wear that badge proudly, John. I'm a proud wonk. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. One thing that this made me think, the survey, was it made me think back to um, back to the late 90s and the dawn of uh, the internet. Um, and I was thinking that if you had the GSS survey back then, um, it'd been running, say, say you'd had it running in the 1990s, we might see a year like this for the internet, because I can remember being involved in, the, in, in, in that excitement and the dot-com boom. Uh, of course, it was swiftly followed by um, a correction. <laughs> dot com crash you, and, and the, the nature of markets is isn't it over, over, we, they go up and then they go down and um, we, we've seen this kind of inflation of um some people's share prices particularly in video that people are getting very very kind of excited about they're, they're, there's always a down do you, do you do you feel we're on the brink of a correction with ai so much in that question john it's a brilliant question i'm going to just firstly go back to 1999, then I'm going to come forward to NVIDIA. So, and the question of whether one particular share price represents an entire category of software. So let's go back to 1999. I totally remember it. Now, just for accuracy's sake, we're not talking about the birth of the internet here. We're talking about the World Wide Web and yes. its popularization, because after all, it was in 1989 that Tim Berners-Lee put forward the thesis for the World Wide Web, which that then, uh, I believe, launched in 1990. It takes nine years for that to come mm. to people's consciousness. Why? Because that's how things happen. We'll come back to this point in a minute. It's really important. Um, oh, my Lord, it was exciting times. I was involved. I stayed in my current company then for six months too long before leaving to set up my own startup. That was a mistake, because in those six months, I really missed the boat. And I couldn't get the funding I needed. And in the end, I ended up bootstrapping my company very effectively, which was probably a good thing because if I had a lot of money, I would have faced the position that a lot of companies face right now, which is I got money at a high valuation and I could not make the thing pay. So I was actually in a better position, strangely. Um, let's fast forward to today. So today, actually, there's been a correction already in the venture capital markets with people not putting nearly as much money, uh, VC money, into new startups this year and really since for about the last six to nine months valuations have have fallen off why is that well it's because it's because of the money markets more than anything else but if we look at now nvidia nvidia's share price has been widely matched to that of cisco's right and you put one graph on top of the other and you see that the cisco graph went up and then came down again in terms of the share price NVIDIA's share price has gone up. Now, we all know that, and you could see it happening week by week, sometimes even day by day, in the two, in, from 2000 to 2001, the sudden pulling back from the huge excitement about the dot-com boom and the resultant crash when all these companies, which had been hugely boosted, suddenly fell into nothingness. One of those companies was... Well, one of the companies that didn't fail was lastminute.com, and that, that continued. Um, let's look at NVIDIA. So NVIDIA has a high share price. Cisco had a higher share price, which fell away. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we don't use routers anymore. It doesn't mean we don't have connectivity. On the contrary, what it means is, well, 
that's now part of our daily life. It became commoditized. NVIDIA's product is much more difficult to commoditize. They backed heavily a particular type of uh, chip, and they are winning as a result of that right now. But eventually, and this is something I always say, technology always starts as a differentiator but ends as a commodity because the markets mean that people pile in. So eventually what will happen is, yeah, the NVIDIA share price will fall. Other people will come along. It doesn't mean that the concept of that form of processing in order to enable artificial intelligence is wrong. It just means it's popular enough that other people want to do it. So <laughs> that's a very, quite a long answer to your question, John. The key question is, Cisco pioneered the infrastructure we need for networking, and we are now all networked. NVIDIA is doing the same thing with AI. Will there be, there was a correction in the markets against the proliferation of the World Wide Web, and well, or rather against the overinflated expectations of the World Wide Web. We now use it in a way that you could not believe in 1999. Um, I was married, if I get this right, I was married in 1997. And to go on honeymoon, I read the Sunday Times, I found a small clipping of a, or a small entry of a hotel on the beach in Kenya. And I wrote them a check, I wrote them a letter, we booked ourselves in for that, and we flew off and we organized our honeymoon that way. There was absolutely no way that anybody would do that now. It is just beyond comprehension. That's 30 years. But it's beyond comprehension. With AI, we need to be thinking about it on that time scale. We are at the beginning, the very beginning of a revolution with our daily lives, how we live, how we learn, how we work, which is going to be revolutionized by AI. Sure, sure, it's going to have its ups and downs, and there will be an absolute pushback. I predict there'll be a pushback this year on some parts of AI, certainly next year. But ultimately, in 10 years' time, in 30 years' time, our lives are going to be absolutely different as a result of it. I think you're right. <laughs> I, that um, doesn't mean I'm an AI fanboy. I just think it's the reality. It's the reality of what I see. And I think there are good things and bad things about it. And I think we need to be cognizant of all of that. Um, I always say to people, if you're getting advice from somebody, work out if that person's an advocate, if they're an entertainer, or if they are an advisor. You can be all three of these things, but if you're an advocate, and very often people who are involved very early with technologies are an advocate, that's great. They know a lot about it, but be cautious because an advisor who can see both sides of things may be more use, even if they don't have the technical expertise of the advocate. So be careful in who you get your advice from and always seek out somebody who's prepared to give you the hard truth. Maybe we could add a couple of other um, categories there. Influencer, um, <laughs> big bait merchant, bullshitter. Okay. I wouldn't go, of course, I wouldn't go that far, but you may well be correct. John. Yes. Well, this is the advantage of being a podcaster. There are additional questions, of course, as as well as the main one in the survey, and challenges which you mentioned seemed significant this year as well, uh, since more people answered it, uh, as you pointed out. Um, I was comparing this with the top workplace learning challenges in the CIPD research uh, by Laura Overton, your yep. friend of mine, published in June 2023, uh, which were, I think, in order, learner time, engagement, and budget were, were the biggest challenges. Obviously, it's a very different type of survey. Um, in this year's uh, GSS, survey tech dominates, and, and it, it seems very different challenges. Would you put that down to the different focus of the two surveys, or has something shifted radically since June last year? And as the CIPD published this in June, presumably the data gathering was sort of earlier in the, in the spring that year. So let me just quickly talk about the methodology. So this is a yeah. free text answer, which you know has its delights, but it also means you've got to have a methodology for crunching these words that come in. So we've got 27,000 words, what do we do with them? I, I first analyze the words and then I categorize them. So I analyze the words by looking at 51 particular word stems 
so the the stem skill would cover skilling reskill upskilling so on and i also put them in i put those automatically into nine categories and i then I, I put all the comments into nine categories and that, that automatically works for about 64%. And I go through and do it by hand and get the answer, get the total number up to over 80%. The single word or combination of words that was most popular this year was AI or it was AI and IA and artificial intelligence, all those bundled together, right? In fact, 60 people just answered with the letters AI uh, to the question of what's your biggest challenge. It's the first time that the thing that was hottest is also the thing that is the greatest challenge. Yeah. That was what drove that was what drove the technology shift because of these nine categories, technology was the least popular category, was the bot was the least concerning category last year, and it shifted to being the most concerning category this year. So that's what's driven it. Um, what that has done, it, it also dragged up other issues around technology. Interestingly, so people who are mentioning the word technology of the word technology got mentioned more this year as well as the word ai being used so it was like a general thesis that if you're worried about ai you're going to be worried about everything to the technology <laughs> but having said that if you look at the other categories the only other category that has increased year on year for the past three years in terms of the number of the proportion of people voting for it or per proportion of people providing comments which can be categorized in that way is the resources issue and resources encompasses budgets, time, and everything else you need to do the job. So that actually does support that survey. So it's it is interesting that, and look, if you ask LD people, what have you got a problem with money? They'll always say yes. Hmm. But it's apparent that they have more of a problem with money this year than last year, and last year than the year before. So that's increasing. Um, otherwise, what's happened is the regular concerns of people are in order. Strategy, skills, and talent is the 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 category they're most concerned with, then organizational issues, then delivery. And those three issues all attracted fewer votes this year than last year. And that was primarily as a result of AI sucking up all the attention. So there is more of an overlap there between these two surveys, probably, than might appear apparent to begin with, once you just have a look beneath the surface. Budgets is certainly a concern for people, and more so than it's been in the past. It's a sentiment survey, of course, and reflects the fact that our focus as human beings yeah. tends to be very selective. With this intense focus on AI, what are we perhaps not paying enough attention to that perhaps we should at the moment? John, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely the right question to be asked. And when I look at the survey, I'm, I'm, I see the answer to your question peppering across so many different parts of it. So we're focused on AI as one of our problems. That means people respond with fewer problems to do with strategy, with the organization, with delivery, because they're so focused on the technology. But one of the key areas where I think we are not providing enough focus is absolutely what you've just mentioned about the brain. Now, we don't have learning science on the survey anymore, but just my gut feeling and talking to people is that absolutely we're not looking enough at the business of how people learn. But if I look at the survey, if I look at the three what I call value options, which is consulting more deeply with the business, showing value and performance support, um, consulting and showing value have been on that survey, have been on the survey since 2016. And for the first four years, it looked like they were following that downward trend. But for the past five years, from 2019 to 2023, they bucked the normal trend of going downwards and stayed not just horizontal, they were actually trending very slightly upwards. And so people were really excited and focused on the idea of value and performance and consulting the business to understand what's going on. But this year, they completely fell off a cliff. They all dropped away by almost exactly the same amount. And I can only think that is down to people turning their heads away from something that's quite hard work to the new shiny object of AI. And I think it's a real distraction from what should be a core concern for l and I would love to say, I would love to say the vote's fallen away because we have tackled the issue of showing value in l and and it's not hot anymore. Uh, we haven't. It should be hot. People aren't thinking about it. They're thinking about technology instead. And I think that's a real problem. Let's see if it bounce, if these options and the concern for value bounce back next year. We'll see. You think that um, there, there is any way of bringing those two preoccupations together that um, AI can find, help us to find some way of uh, showing value? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely, it should do. Um, the top five of the table are 
absolutely all about data. And it's an interesting shift from 2016, where we had mobile delivery and um, micro learning in the top five. This year's top five are all about data and skills. So artificial intelligence, reskilling, upskilling, and so on. They're also all about data and skills. And it should be that part of that is we're going to be showing the value of what we're doing. But and, and to be fair, one of the options that did not fall away this year, but maintained its position, was learning analytics. It was personalization, learning analytics, and skills-based talent management bucked the trend, and everything else fell away. Now, learning analytics, if it's used correctly, is a way of showing value. People have said to me, Donald, it should be business analytics. Of course, they're right. But I use the term that people are most familiar with, learning analytics. The idea that we are looking at our data in learning in a way that enables us to show the value and to improve what we're doing. Now, if that's the reason behind voting for learning analytics, great. It's too early to say, and I would like to know more about it. I do know when I look at the challenges bit that, to come back to the CIPD survey, I do know looking at the challenges bit, the business of showing the value of learning continues to be an issue for L&D people. That has not fallen away. So um, perhaps, John, you're right. Perhaps the obsession with data means that we're going to be doing a great job of showing the value of learning in the future. Uh, I only hope so. Now, we have a very important conference coming up, very important in the UK. Uh, and in Europe as well, the Learning Technologies Conference that you chair. Um, last year, I think, was a bit too soon, really, for people to absorb the influence of this new kind of explosion of interest in AI. There's there, There's been a, another year's worth of thinking now, a chance for people to digest. What are you, ex can you give us some kind of taster of what to expect this year from the conference platform? And all the movers and shakers gathering together um, <laughs> with their kind of, you know, their sentiment and opinion and great brains. And thought. I love the idea. I love how you, you portray this as being like a Davos for the L&D world. I'm not quite sure it's it's that. But well, there's yeah, plenty of other we... cynical takes on it. That it's a meat market, <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> we pull people together and we try to have good conversations. That's that's yes, my, yes, yes. my view. Um, I would say it is still too early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, we are still at the excited about phase. So I did this survey with Egler Binauskaita back in yep. November. Friend of the podcast. At, yeah. And we looked at what's the what's been happening with AI and L&D. And even in a self-selecting survey of people who were interested in AI and L&D, 45% of employers were either doing nothing or were just experimenting with the use of AI. Now, we're running another survey at the moment. We're looking to it. It is still the case that finding good case studies is almost impossible next yeah. year 2025 we'll have some good stuff we have some good stuff this year but it is still largely a matter of working out which areas we're using it in unless like with ericsson um, and other organizations doing the skills you've already been using it for a while and you haven't just jumped on the bandwagon so we have that we also have a case study about use of ai and the use of a of a call center to enable people to get performance support exactly when they need it. So those things are absolutely uh, there. But for me, actually, one of the key topics we'll be talking about at the conference is the uh, session by Stella Lee talking about what skills and competencies do we need to be ready in L&D to deal with AI? For me, that's actually fundamental. We get that straight, the rest of it should fall into place. Yeah, I mean, that that is an interesting one because it, in a sense... I mean, you could say nobody knows. <laughs> um, so to have any kind of clarity about, you know, what how you think it's going to change would, would be really interesting. So how I think, I think what's going sorry, how I think what's going uh, to change. John. Well, how, how the kind of L and D skill set might need to change. When I started in L and D, and I started in nineteen eighty seven or eighty six, I can't honestly remember. I think eighty seven as a stand up trainer, teaching English as a foreign language. Went on to do training in. A whole bunch of things around software there were two things that you did you conveyed information either by in person or via printed material right and that's how lnd had been since time immemorial now 
the role of L&D hasn't changed, but the tools that we use have. So I would argue that our role is to enable individuals and organizations to fulfill their potential. So we help individuals flourish. We help organizations be profitable, or if they're in a service organization in the government sector, to do great work. We do that with new tools now, entirely new tools. And I think about people like Guy Wilmshurst-Smith at Network Rail, who yeah. said to me, Donald, what I'm doing is I'm shifting my team, and he's got a team of 600 people in his training department, from being a training function, an HR function, to being a data function. That's his words. I think that's the future of L&D. So I think it's a huge skill set shift. There are other skills we need to, have to be better at, marketing, consulting, and so on. But the ultimate skill that's going to change what L&D does is being better at data. And for me, actually, that's the story from this year's survey. Looking at the top five of the table, AI is like the rocket that shoots out of the firework display and illuminates the sky up above. Underneath, there are Catherine wheels, Roman candles, everything else that's going off in an ongoing display, which is the data display. And for me, it's the combination of high processing power, cheap processing power, um, data, just vast volumes of it being accessible, and of course, the programming skills to, to do the analysis of that data. All of that leads to a bunch of things happening, one of which is AI, but other things as well. So personalization in learning doesn't need to be necessarily AI. It can just be good use of data to enable it to happen, but it's happening. And mm. in order to be able to make the best use of this, AI, sorry, L&D needs to be a data savvy part of the organization. It doesn't mean you need to be able to program in Python or SQL, but it does mean you need to be able to ask questions. And then when the answers come back, iterate and ask again and ask again. I always say it's the second question is the key one for analysis. What's, what does that mean? Well, you're telling me this answer. What if this, that, and the other? I think that's the skill set that LMD does. And it's a, it's a million miles away from those skills I had in 1987 around being able to stand in front of a room and deliver a course. It's entirely different. It's a big change that LMD needs to be ready for. So in personnel terms, as to use a very old fashioned word, that's the, <laughs> that's the demand side of mm. the equation. Mm. In terms of the, the supply, the labor supply, as it were, um, you must have uh, a, a lot of conflict with the uh, uh, contact, sorry, with the people who are coming into the industry who are at a much younger age now through your 30 under 30 thing, which mm, is, mm. is brilliant. I, and I know that the, um, the ATD do one of these in the States as well. How do you fl reflect on the way that the people coming into the industry have changed with their kind of skill set? Because it used to be that everybody came into it through having been a stand-up trainer into this industry. Yeah. And now, yeah. you know, presumably there are there are other kind of feeder streams, other disciplines that um, people are coming to this industry through now. How have you seen that change? It's a really great point, John. And yes, the 30 under 30s, which is a program that runs with learning technologies. And we don't, it doesn't mean that we are reflecting people's accomplishments. What we rather try and do is support their potential. So if we see people who've got great potential, give them a a very highly discounted ticket to the conference and we support them during the conference with a program of events and afterwards. So a lot of people say, oh, why are you, why are you praising these 30 under 30s? Well, what we're trying to do is invest in them for the future. And yes, you're right. A lot of them are data savvy in a way that most people 30 years ago weren't. I, I actually came in from a, a science slash computer programming background. So I, I was reasonably data savvy, but most people weren't. And I think there's a there's definitely a shift there. You know what? I'd love to do. <laughs> I'd love to do another survey of new people in the industry and start doing that and discovering what are their skill sets and how do they see themselves needing to develop in the future. That would be fascinating, John. Yeah, because there's a much longer throw in terms of they're looking forward to how they expect their their, their careers to change. I suppose you get to kind of you know not going to be rude, but you and me, our end of the. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at 30 years. Um, yeah, I think a bit, a bit longer perhaps, than 30 you know, years in my case, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're coming into this industry now and you're kind of like a 20-something, a, a I, I just can't imagine what it must be like to look ahead and think, 
how is my career going to shift with the changes well, that I can foresee over the next, you know, 20, 30 years? People don't know what's going to happen, but their answer to that question would reflect the current thinking about it and, and the noise and the words they see in the wordscape. It would be absolutely fascinating to understand that and see how that's being reflected right now in what people are talking about. My guess is that there would be an awful lot of talk about engagement, video and TikTok, as well as talk about data and AI, because those are the things which are people are talking about at the moment. Um, it would also be interesting to have a look at the job titles and the job requirements that people are putting out there for uh, L&D jobs. Um, mm. Blue Eskimo would be a great organisation. I may go and talk to them about that and see if there's a, if there are any patterns in the data set they've got. They do some really good research as well themselves. Yeah, to be fair. and we've had them on the podcast. Yeah. Yes. Of course you have. Of course we have. I usually ask my guests who they follow and are influenced by. However, I realise with your role in chairing several high-profile conferences around the world, this might run you into a conflict of interest scenario. But knowing that you are a fully rounded human being, I'm interested to know <laughs> what and who you take inspiration and insights from outside perhaps the immediate pool of sages and gurus. You know, I could ask you and your Marcus Bernhardt and Aigler and, you know, Stella and, and a load of other people. If you look outside our, our our kind of our bubble, outside our world, what in the outside world do you take inspiration and insight from? Uh, that is a great question, John, and I would answer pretty unequivocally. People I've met in the past and people I uh, I follow now, it, typically in the area of natural science and thinking. So three people that come to mind absolutely immediately are, and I'll I'll, I'll give you two, and then I'll give you one from the past to wrap up with Chris Stringer who's at the Natural History Museum and is an absolutely fabulous author on human evolution, who is so punctilious in his use of data and always, always when you're talking about human evolution, you're looking at bones in the ground and, you know, you might have all of the data that you could possibly talk about might fill the average living room, right? And yeah. you've got to draw a map of the past from that. And when you do it, you cannot make leaps of speculation. Or if you do, you have to be very... And I absolutely take inspiration from his punctilious use of the scientific method in that. Um, similarly, Paul Johnson of, I think it is the oh, Centre for Economic Studies. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I'm going to look it up as, as I'm talking. But Paul Johnson uh, in the UK has a very level-headed, non-partisan view of what is happening in the economic, uh, it's the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. There we go. Yes, that's right. Um, and he is absolutely clear about the numbers. And then he says, those are the numbers, and here's my inference from that. And he's able to distinguish, able to say, that's that these are the facts, and this is what I think they mean, and able to take bold claims by politicians and put them to the test where they usually fail. And I think being able to do that coldly and rationally is fantastic. But for me, the person who sums up this scientific approach and the ability to look at data and think about the world in a rational way, but also have tremendous humanity, which of course, both Paul Johnson and Chris Stringer have. Um, the way the person who encapsulates that for me is Carl Sagan, who sadly is no longer with us, mm -hmm. the American cosmologist who I was lucky enough to see as a teenager. I'd get the train up from Guildford, uh, get up to Waterloo, get the underground off, and I'd literally run up the tube. Uh, the Piccadilly Lines, uh, the Northern Lines quite, quite steep. I'd run up the tube uh, steps because I was so keen to get to the Royal Institution. And I think this must have been 78, 79, when he did the Christmas lectures um, at the Royal Institution. He did not have PowerPoint. He didn't use any slides. He had a few objects in his hands to talk to this audience of teenage boys and girls about the cosmos and how it was. The and cosmos. he knew yeah. exactly, exactly. He had that way of saying cosmos in a way that was just, he had this wonderful voice that drew you in, but he also had this great humanity. And he was able to entrance this entire room full of fairly geeky boys and girls in what he was talking about the universe. And set it not just in a matter of facts and figures, which is obviously important, but also, also talking about how seemingly insignificant we are, but how extraordinary life is at the same time. And 
I would recommend anybody just go and look at Carl Sagan talking online on YouTube about anything, and he will inspire you. He inspired me to try to have some of that same rationality and also, I, I wouldn't say inspiration, but try to bring humanity to the rationality in a way that will help people do their jobs better. So if you ask me who I find inspiration from, I'd say someone like Carl Sagan, and that's lasted all my life. Thank you, Donald. I think we've all got a bit of inspiration from what you've shared with us today. Hopefully. Um, and thanks for coming in again. Um, look, and same time, same place next year, maybe. <laughs> if we're both still here, I would love to be here, John. Okay. Cheers. Thanks very much. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is among the top 5% most listened to podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes, we found out. But it depends for its existence solely on sponsorship and your Patreon contributions. If you want us to continue holding these excellent conversations about learning, it's you who said they're excellent, not us. Let's have a chat about your company sponsoring or sign up to patreon.com slash learning hack and for a piddlingly small amount of money, get transcripts, text summaries and early access. Keep us alive. Until next time. Stay classy, learning people. Now I finally get it.